As Los Angeles hurtles into the future, we imagine its past to have been free of big city heartbreak and crime. Far from it. Fifty years ago, mystery writer Raymond Chandler portrayed a city with more than its share of misery and murder. The streets of Los Angeles, he wrote, were mean streets. Out there in the night of a thousand crimes, people were dying, being maimed, cut by flying glass. People were hungry, sick, bored. Desperate with loneliness or remorse or fear. Angry, cruel, feverish, shaken by sobs. A city no worse than others. A city rich and vigorous and full of pride. A city lost and beaten and full of emptiness. Writing in the 30s and 40s, Raymond Chandler created a vision of Los Angeles as a promised city stained by crime and corruption. And the crooks weren't just in the streets. They had the police department on the take. They called the shots in City Hall. Attorney Grant Cooper was there. Raymond Chandler was right. The city of Los Angeles was, at that time, was as corrupt as any city in the United States, and that includes Chicago. Heaven on earth, soft ocean breezes, an uncomplicated corner of paradise. In 1930, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, the nation's first, proclaimed the city's delights. The air of prosperity is deceptive, for the stock market had crashed and the city was hard hit. Even the booming oil business was affected. Though for a time, there was money to be made here in Long Beach. The staff of the Dabney Oil Syndicate. In the back row far left, an urbane English-educated executive in his early 40s. Though an excellent administrator, he was a hard drinker. Raymond Chandler. He wrote, It was a good job. So good I couldn't hold it. They tossed me out during the Depression. In the city directory, Chandler and his wife listed a new address in Hollywood. Jobless and at loose ends, he listed what he hoped would be a new occupation. Writer. He weathered the worst of the Depression at the El Pueblo Apartments. He later wrote, I went five days without anything to eat but soup once. It didn't kill me, but neither did it increase my love of humanity. Chandler distracted himself reading hard-boiled detective magazines. He found them forceful and honest. And he decided to try his own hand at evoking what he called the smell of fear. For inspiration, he only needed to walk out the door. To Chandler, Los Angeles in the 30s was society gone wrong. In his words, the city was a paradise of fakers.
Behind its placid facade, he saw the place to be populated by dope fiends, smut peddlers, schemers in low places and high, crooked cops and crooked politicians. Though the sun might shine and the warm breezes blow, Los Angeles was haunted by corruption and not infrequently death. death, be it accidental or by design, to Chandler it was the big sleep. In his first full-length novel, Chandler introduced a detective hero intent on doing battle with the vices of Los Angeles. In the film version, he's played by Humphrey Bogart, who Chandler felt was the genuine article. Pardon me. Who is he? Philip Marlowe. Hobart Arms, Franklin Street, special license, deputy badge and all. Marlowe could take it, and he could dish it out. Maybe you need this. And I don't like your manners. I don't mind if you don't like my manners. I don't like them myself. They're pretty bad. I grieve over them long winter evenings. People don't talk to me like that. Oh. Say, mister, would you please... But why Philip Marlowe? Wasn't it the role of the police to chase criminals and solve crimes? Where were they? This is just our way of staying lay off. Chandler wrote, The law is where you buy it in this town. This old Los Angeles station house was witness to the state of affairs in the police department in the depths of the Depression. Money was scarce, morals got pushed. For a $50 bribe, you could buy a job as a sergeant. You could be a detective for 125, a captain for 250. The force was under the command of Chief James Davis, Two Gun Davis. In some respects, his men were good, reasonably honest cops. They effectively tracked down major criminals. Vice was another matter. Quite a show was made of raiding brothels and collaring bookies. Roundups made the newsreels. George Howe, alias John Wynn, alias A.E. Stone. Yet they were soon back on the street. Even in the shadow of City Hall, vice flourished. Ace crime reporter for the city news service, Jake Jacoby, worked the downtown beat. There was about 50 bordellos, probably more. Uh, I wasn't too familiar with them because I didn't inhabit them. <laughs> But, you know, as a newsman, you'd get word, there's one here, there's one there. How come they don't uh, take, take action, this kind of thing? I have issued orders to all members of the police department of this city to bring in every reckless driver, drunken driver... Police Chief Davis. He took a hard line on traffic violations, but he looked the other way when it came to the payoffs made to the police by madams and hundreds of bookies. I would say they're on the take a bit, and uh, there was a, a bookmaking establishment, a large one, right kitty corner from the Hall of Justice. Most of the complaints came from distraught housewives, wa wives of, uh, uh, of officials and, and sheriffs and policemen who's, uh, who were spending their money at the bookie joint. <laughs> there were more serious complaints. Raymond Chandler, for one took a dim view of the proliferation of guns toted by L.A.'s lowlife. As recorded in a 30s newsreel, all manner of firearms were openly for sale. Any strings attached to this? No. $38 and no questions asked. Good, I'll take it. 
Finally pressured to quell L.A.'s gun craze, Chief Davis seized an opportunity to improve his image. He confiscated hardware by the boatload. If there was a symbol of wide open L.A. in the 30s, it was the score of gambling ships anchored off Long Beach and Santa Monica. The Rex was the most famous. Water taxis took customers on a fast ride to just beyond the three mile limit, beyond the reach of the law. After an occasional pat down to make sure they weren't packing heat, they were free to give Dame Fortune a whirl. There was roulette, tango, craps, feral, and blackjack. Three thousand people could gamble at a time. The action continued around the clock. Give me uh, five hundred dollars on the check, please. All right, just put a marker up. Former rum runner Tony Cornero was the unofficial admiral of the gambling fleet. He was not a man to be crossed. Yet he confessed a soft spot for his customers. Tony didn't care for the word sucker. He preferred to call his clientele squirrels. Drab but cheerful little creatures looking for a little entertainment, a little excitement, a little wickedness. Tony's squirrels, the gambling ship Rex, and the admiral himself. Tough, cocky, and not without charm. In fictionalized form, they achieved immortality in the final chapters of Farewell, My Lovely, perhaps Raymond Chandler's finest novel. In the first of many film versions, Dick Powell played Detective Philip Marlowe. I didn't see anything. I felt it. I was a toad on a wet rock. A snake was looking at the back of my neck. He's brave, moral, incorruptible. He never quits. Trouble is his business. the blackjack right behind my ear. A black pool opened up at my feet. I dived in. It had no bottom. Marlowe's nightmare. Pursued by an evil force, he's caught in a maze of crime and deceit. A mirror of Chandler's perception of Los Angeles. Regrettably, there was no listing for Philip Marlowe among L.A.'s real-life gumshoes. In Raymond Chandler's words, the typical L.A. detective was a sleazy little drudge, a strong-arm guy with no more personality than a blackjack. There was an exception. Private investigator Harry Raymond. Newspaper man Jake Jacoby recalls. Harry Raymond was very resourceful, and I would say an excellent investigator, and a good cop. He was a very flamboyant character. Uh, he certainly wasn't a shrinking violet. Uh, by the way, that was an expression from the old days. You don't hear it anymore. Uh, but that means, in effect, that he wasn't too much withdrawn. Well, his investigation techniques were not only thorough, but somewhat abrupt. I don't know if he'd fit it in modern society, but he was sure right for his time. He didn't like crooks. In late 1937, Harry Raymond was about to get involved in the case of his career. He got a new client, Clifford Clinton, the owner of an exotically decorated downtown cafeteria. Clinton was good-hearted. 
so good-hearted that he let his customers pay what they could. Or not at all. Clifford Clinton was also an active reformer. He didn't have to go far from his cafeteria to see that Los Angeles could use his help. But he needed facts, hard evidence of the city's corruption. He needed Harry Raymond. Back when he was a teenager, Clifford Clinton's son, Ed, helped out. Uh, Harry Raymond was asked by Dad to investigate many of these things and check them out, check out the sources, because here we were every night going on the radio. We would come on the air at 7 o'clock, I believe it was, and I would say, this is the people's voice. The cause is right, I know. And then I would begin to say, now, Father, we have a question here from a listener. How do you know that such and such was going on? Who wants to stand firm in the cause against years and years of the avalanche of abuse, ridicule, defamation, and physical harm that ensues from evil forces? And he mentioned names, and he mentioned addresses, and he mentioned incidents. I can only say at this time... As a result of the checking out of facts that Harry Raymond and others did, he was in a position to give highly specific information, no matter how high corruption led... We can stay united behind that cause, which is simply honest, efficient government. We can't lose. This wasn't exactly what certain highly placed people wanted to hear. And now our story becomes as complex, as seamy, as intense as a Raymond Chandler thriller. The newly re-elected mayor of Los Angeles, Frank L. Shaw. Fellow citizens. The confidence expressed in my public service by the people at the polls is extremely gratifying. To my mind, at least, in my opinion, he was a pompous ass. A man who knew City Hall all too well, reform attorney Grant Cooper. One could say that Frank Shaw, the mayor, was the figurehead. And his brother, Joe, did all the dirty work behind the scenes. At least that's the way it appeared to me. Joe Shaw was his brother's trusted executive secretary and the man who doled out the city contracts, the jobs, the favors. In the city hall in Los Angeles, you could buy a job... Uh, bribes were everyday affairs. It was a it was a different city then than it is today. In late 1937, aware that Detective Harry Raymond was sniffing around City Hall, Joe Shaw got nervous. He was in touch with less than perfect police chief James Davis. In turn, Davis had under his command the final player in our real-life drama, Earl Kynett, the shadowy head of the L.A. Police Intelligence Unit. On behalf of the Shaw administration, Kynett took it upon himself to cool down Clifford Clinton and his overly inquisitive detective, Harry Raymond, even if it meant playing rough. October 27th, 1937 the Clinton children were tucked in for the night and at 12 midnight we heard a tremendous crash so we all three ran downstairs and we saw coming up from the basement all this black smoke so we ran to the corner as kids always had wanted to do to the firebox on the corner broke the glass and pulled the switch and before you know it the firemen were there but we we saw that the whole basement and part of the kitchen and part of the main floor were destroyed and they found that there had been a bomb planted in the basement of the house well just a few minutes after the bombing occurred dad received a phone call and the person on the other end of the phone said well how did you like the little puff puff you just had if you think that was something just keep your nose in this business where you don't have any place and see what happens next quiet neighborhood in Boyle Heights, the home of Detective Harry Raymond. 
As his investigations for reformer Clifford Clinton continued, he was put under surveillance by the Los Angeles Police Intelligence Unit. Across the street and up an alley, they rented a spy house. Looking out this very window, Earl Kynette, the head of the unit, could keep tabs on Raymond and with a phone tap, listen in on his calls probing City Hall. January 14th, 1938. Harry Raymond's wife was fresh out of eggs. Shaved and dressed for the day, Harry volunteered to run by the market. He grabbed the keys and headed for the car. Got in, stepped on the starter. The explosion was heard for miles around. For blocks in all directions, windows were smashed. Authorities raced to the scene, as did reformer Clifford Clinton. Harry Raymond proved as tough as fictional Philip Marlowe. A mass of broken bones and more than a hundred bloody wounds. He was heard to mumble, This is a rotten way to try and get a man. For weeks, doctors dug shrapnel out of him and still didn't get all of it. Harry couldn't believe what had happened to him and at first was mum as to who he thought tried to kill him. But then one of his doctors received a threatening phone call. That did it. Kynet, Earl Kynet, he blurted. And with those words, he blew the lid off Los Angeles. trial was sensational. Taken to the Hall of Justice in a wheelchair, Harry Raymond was cheered on by crowds shouting, Stay in there, Harry. Tell them all of it, Harry. Good luck, Harry. The courtroom is abandoned now, but in 1938 it was packed and hushed as Harry Raymond testified about City Hall payoffs, bribes, bagmen, and a near-fatal attempt to cool him off. It didn't look good for Earl Kynette. In desperation, he attempted to impress the jury by improving his appearance with glasses and a mustache. It didn't work. The evidence mounted. He was even identified as the buyer of the bomb's detonating wire. In the final days of the trial, police chief James Davis took the stand, couldn't get his story straight, and dug Kynette in even further. People against Early, Kynette, and others. Are the defendants ready for sentence at this time? Defendants are ready, Your Honor. The verdict went out over the airwaves. Will the defendants arise, please? Whereas you, Early Kynette, have been duly found guilty by a jury in this court of the crime of attempted murder, it is therefore ordered, judged, and decreed that you be punished by imprisonment in the state prison at San Quentin. He got ten years to life, and the trial exposed the city hall rife with corruption. Reformers and newspapers clamored for a special election to recall the Mayor Shaw administration. It had become too blatant. And... Uh... Newspapers don't like the reputation of the city of angels to be dragged in the dirt and the mire. So Fletcher Barron was elected on the recall. And from that, the walls came tumbling down gradually. Grant Cooper now and then as campaign manager for L.A.'s reform mayor, Fletcher Bowron. He threw the rascals out because, by God, he threw them out like a bouncer does. You see him in the movies. Bowen's takeover was truly remarkable. For the first time in American history, the mayor of a major city and all his cronies were run out of office.
three miles off the Santa Monica Pier, the curtain rang down on L.A.'s brush with iniquity in the 30s. In a decade, the wrecks and other gambling ships had cashed in on over 12 million visitors. But now the time had come for Admiral of the Fleet, Tony Cornero, to pack it in. These visitors were from the state attorney general's office. And they too couldn't wait to get to the slot machines and the gaming tables. As 1938 drew to a close, it was all over for a thousand brothels, bookie joints, and gambling dens. There had been trouble enough in Angel City, which all goes to show that when writer Raymond Chandler pitted his detective hero against a corrupt and criminal world, he didn't have to dream it up. 